Welcome to the Energy Design Systems Load Calculator Program. In this module, I'm going to show you how to do the data entry process for performing a new load calculation. Once you log in and you're at this screen, you can go ahead and type in the address in this window here. And as you do so, you will see you have a drop down of options that start to populate. The more you type, obviously, the quicker it will populate for you to pull up the house. Now, I do want to remind you of the program parameters and load calculation requirements module that we discussed previously that does require you to do a full survey of the house to gather all the information that you need to do a complete and accurate load calculation. There is no substitute for this process because there is no database on the planet from which we can gather all the information about this house. While we do pull in some information and we pre-populate the fields, again, you do need to verify or modify all the data points, and the instructions clearly explain that all up here. Let's go ahead and get started. Once you've entered the address, you can see the house will populate in the screen below. You tell the software what direction most of the glass faces on this particular house. In this house, most of the glass is on the back of the house, and that's facing north. Every time we make a change in the software, the load is adjusting live because we are tied into the internet and updating all the parameters. From there, you slide on down, and you can go ahead and enter the glass square footage associated with each compass direction of the house. Now, for time purposes, I'm going to assume that this data is accurate. We basically make an estimation of 14.5% of the square footage of the house based on the Department of Energy guidelines, and we apportion that glass around the house. But again, no substitute for you having measured all the windows in the house. Plug them into the proper compass direction. Go ahead and turn the lock on so that they don't change throughout the process. And then you can go ahead and put in any uh, shading associated with those windows. Shading is going to be basically windows, uh, drapes, blinds, uh, trees, as well as overhangs. And if you're not sure what you need to enter in every field, as you can see here, there is a little pop-up help at every data entry point to answer your questions. There's also the instructions up here under the resources tab as you go throughout the process. Again, because the software is tied to some third-party resources on the internet, we pull in the square footage based on uh, third-party real estate information. Now, we have no way of knowing that that is accurate, so you have to verify that based on your survey of the house and measuring it, or you can pull in that information maybe from a county database. We have no way of accessing all the county databases in the United States and Canada, so we are tying into uh, two real estate platforms that gather some of that information, and I can't tell you that it's always accurate, but it is most of the time. You can make any adjustments to this process, uh, in this process. In addition to that, you can go ahead and size for a room for a system, for a zone, or any aspect or portion of the house that you want. And that's what this information says right here. So you don't necessarily have to calculate a load for the whole house if you have a multi-system house and you want to just calculate, let's say, the system associated with the second floor and calculate that load. Plug in only the load-bearing data associated with that system in that floor and override all the data points below. And it will go ahead and calculate a load for that system alone. But let's assume that the data that we've pulled in is accurate for the square footage and that the weather data that we've pulled in also for this zip code is accurate. I'm not going to go ahead and make any changes to that. We're plugging in what we call the 99% temperatures. If you disagree with those temperatures, you are uh, uh, able to override any of those temperatures, but those temperatures are associated with the 99% temperatures, meaning we don't get over these temperatures or below these temperatures 99% of the time. And even if you did, you probably do so for just a couple hours on a couple days of the year. So we don't want to go ahead and size equipment nowadays for the extremes that we rarely reach because then you're oversized 90 plus percent of the time, which requires them to buy a bigger machine, which costs more to operate and doesn't keep them as comfortable. Today's high efficiency and advanced technology equipment is, needs to be sized as close to the load as possible, both on the heat loss as well as the heat gain. And I would suggest that you have a conversation with your manufacturer regarding equipment capabilities and sizing requirements specifically for your manufacturer. We're going to go ahead and finish conducting a load specifically for the house, not any one line of particular equipment. So we go ahead and we have our weather data all plugged in here. Summer outdoor, uh, indoor, summer outdoor. Grains of moisture, which is associated with humidity. Instead of relative humidity, we're looking at the grains of moisture that gets pulled in. The summer wet bulb the winter indoor dry bulb, the winter outdoor design temperature, and then the sensible heat ratio design. And so what this is, is the manufacturer's ability to do the job. 
meaning the load's not going to change, but because the machines have different matchups, you can match a different indoor coil or air handler with a different outdoor unit, as well as a variable speed fan, and you can modulate or change what the capacity of that machine's capability is. And so you have to basically pick how much sensible capacity that machine has, and every manufacturer and every matchup varies. And so that number is going to range probably somewhere between 69% of the total capacity as well as up to 80% of the total capacity. So we pick a number right in the middle of the road there at 75% or 0.75 as that sensible heat rating of the machine. You can go ahead and change that once you know the manufacturer's matchup you're going to plug in there if you so choose after you've performed the load and selected the equipment, but you don't have to because this will get you close enough to size the equipment properly. From there, you plug in the number of residents. The number of residents is based off of the number of bedrooms, plus one for the master bedroom. We're going to go ahead and plug in the average ceiling height, which is nine foot in this particular house. This house ha is a uh, two-story house, and it is a contemporary design, and so not all of the uh, floor area is actually equal to the attic area because there is a second floor over the first floor, and so we will go ahead and override that data. We're going to plug in the insulation values for uh, the attic or ceiling in this particular case, right? Because we only have the load bearing ceiling on the second floor as being our area of heat loss. And so that R value is associated with the drywall as well as the insulation above the drywall. And so we'll leave that at R22 because the uh, insulation is an R19 and then the drywall is gonna be an R3 and that gives us an R22 combined. From there, we go ahead and we plug in the wall square footage. In this particular case, the wall square footage is actually going to be a little bit less than this because we have shorter walls and there's no, again, no way for me to know how much that is without having measured those walls. So we measure those walls, we subtract the windows from those walls and that gives us the exposed outside wall area for the load, for load purposes. Now in this particular house, the insulation, as well as the drywall, as well as the sheathing on the outside of the house, as well as the siding or brick facing on the outside of the house, is going to combine to give us that R value of the outside wall. And so in this particular case, we're going to call that R15 for that sandwich, which is again, the outside facing, which in this case is cedar siding, with the sheathing behind the cedar siding, with the insulation between the studs, with the drywall inside the house to get to an R15. The glass U value, again, if you didn't know what that meant, is single pane, double pane, or triple pane. And in this case, it's double pane windows, so we will leave this at 0.5 for the U value. The solar heat gain factor, most contractors don't know what this means, but simply put is, do you have just simply clear glass or do you have the argon filled glass, which might be a little tinted, and therefore is considered low emittance or low E glass. In this particular case, these windows have not been upgraded, so we will leave it at the 0.85 just to be conservative. Again, I'm going to recommend that you consult construction data that's available online for the various construction components if you're not familiar with what the R values are and U values are of various construction components. We're giving you the ability to plug the information in that you should know from gathering the data from the house. From there, you basically determine what kind of floor conditions do you have. Do you have a floor over a basement? Do you have a basement floor? Where you're, where you're conditioning the basement, or do you have a floor over an unconditioned crawl space or garage, or do you have a slab floor? And you can have multiple conditions. So in this particular case, all of the house is over the basement, and that is 1978 over the basement. There is no insulation in the basement ceiling, but we still have the plywood floor as well as the hardwood floor carpet or tile on top of the plywood, and there's an R value there. All R values associated with any square footage in the space have to have an R value in them. You cannot divide by zero, and R values in the equations for calculating loads are uh, the, the denominator and get divided in. So you cannot have by simple mathematics, mathematical principles, a zero in the denominator. So in this case, we're gonna have the R value of the plywood floor and the hardwood on top of that throughout the house. Carpet and hardwood are about the same. And again, you can pull that information up online from many, many resources available for R values for various construction components based on the conditions that you find in the home. So 
we're going to go ahead, we have no room and enter the R value of five. We have no basement floor below grade. While there is a basement in this house, it's not conditioned, so we are not accounting for it, so no square footage needs to be plugged in here. We can leave the R value there because it's not going to be multiplied against anything. We have, don't have to worry about the basement below grade. And then we have the floor over an unconditioned crawl space or garage in this case. And again, we don't have that particular condition. If we did, we plug in the square footage associated with it. We would plug in the R value for the, for the floor, meaning the crawl space ceiling or the garage ceiling in that case. And then we would plug in the temperature of that space during the winter. So for example, if we're sizing for 14 degrees outside in this particular load, the crawl space or the garage would not probably be that cold. So we would enter what we would believe the temperature to be on the coldest design day in that space. So in this case, the average is accepted at 45, but again, we don't have that condition, so we can go ahead and ignore that. And we also don't have any rooms on slab, meaning slab on grade. And if you did, you would plug in the perimeter, which is the edge, the linear edge of that perimeter, not the square footage of the room on the slab, but the edge. You would then go ahead and put in the value of the insulation around the edge of the perimeter of the slab. That you're probably not going to know because it's going to be covered probably by flooring uh, as far as carpet tile or hardwood and you're not going to know that. You might gather some of this information from the homeowner who may know this if they built the house or has a set of blueprints. And if you have that, you can get all the detailed information you need on all the R values for uh, the entire home. But again, you would have to guess based on when the house was built and the codes for that time in your area of the country. And then we have what is considered other heat losses and heat gains. Duck loss and duck gain if you're not measuring those with a duct blaster or a flow hood and anemometers, then you're going to have to guess. The average duct system leaks 25 to 40% according to the EPA and Department of Energy, but I would say be conservative and probably plug in a number for, as it says here, thermal losses as well as gains, duct leakage losses, design losses, crushed duct or poorly installed ducts. And so in this particular case, we'll go ahead and plug in 20% duck loss and obviously duck gain as well, because if you're losing a certain amount, you're probably gaining a certain amount as well. From there, we're going to plug in the infiltration rate. You don't know the infiltration rate, so you're probably going to have to guess. 0.6 and 0.8 are the average uh, infiltration rates for average homes across the United States and Canada. If you have a leaky home, such as an 18th century farmhouse, you can go ahead and increase these numbers to probably 1 or 1.2. And if you have a very super tight energy efficient house that does not leak and is well insulated and well sealed, you could go ahead and lower these numbers accordingly. The only way to calculate them is with a infiltrometer or blower door test. But since you don't know them, you're probably going to go ahead and accept the average for the typical home. The last two entry points are for winter ventilation and summer ventilation. And what that means is you're bringing in fresh air mechanically into the house and maybe even in through the system with the likes of an ERV, or an HRV or a fresh air intake ducted directly into the return duct system. And if you're doing that, go ahead and plug in the CFM associated with, with that device. And that is the data entry point and process for conducting a load. While you've done so, the entire load has been calculated for you and you have the cooling load, the heating load, the adequate exposure diversity graph, the monthly loads being broken down, here is the total heating load, here is the total cooling load, and then you can see month by month how the uh, requirements change on the house based on the needs for that area of the country. The heating load is broken down by its various facets, and then the cooling load is also broken down by its various facets. From there, you can generate a report, which we will discuss in another module.